And one thing that Magic said when I was getting these triple doubles, and he was as well because he was the original leader, mm -hmm. and he said, you're 6'3", I'm 6'9". I will last at this game a lot longer than you will because I don't have to jump as high, run as far, <laughs> and do as much. And I think that was one of the things that comes out as a compliment because now one of your peers who recognized as a triple-double king is now telling you some of the same things that you're already achieving. Then you are in Australia right now. You're talking NBA basketball. You're talking great teams. You're talking great individual players. Takes it off and there's number 23. And of course, Johnny goes nuts. So I'm getting first bumps thinking about it now. I just tried to go out there and play my game. I have no idea what you're talking about, Adam. I don't like anybody. I'm not a people person. Strand, you made the pass. Yes. Christian, can you catch the ball? Yes. All the stars were aligned and all the muscles fired at the right time. And I was able to get off the ground and throw one down. I was saving that as a surprise for you. And now, introducing your host for In All Airness, Adam Ryan. Welcome to episode 98. Thanks for joining me. Just before we get into the show, a brief side note. My sincere condolences to everyone affected by the tragic loss of Kobe Bryant and his daughter Gianna. So too, the seven other occupants who lost their lives on January 26, 2020. Without question, as shocking as any event that has happened in my 30 plus years of following the NBA. Today, I'm excited to welcome Pueblo High School legend, Arizona State University Hall of Famer, and two-time NBA All-Star, Lafayette Fat Lever. Fat discusses his storied career and offers plenty of great insight into his fantastic on-court exploits. Near the end of the conversation, you'll hear me mention Chicago as it pertains to 2020 NBA All-Star Weekend barely seven days from now as I record this. There's a strong possibility that I'll have an opportunity to meet with Fat in person and some other former NBA players and alumni of my show, which is fantastic, as my wife Lisa and I will be holidaying in the USA at the same time. Fingers crossed I'll have more specifics to share about this next month upon our return home to Australia. For context, this conversation was recorded on January 24. Towards the end of the episode, I'll share another great podcast review. You can add yours by visiting inallairness.com slash review. Show notes for this episode, including links to numerous topics covered, will be available at inallairness.com slash 98. Now, on to the show. My guest today was often referred to as a triple-double waiting to happen. He excelled at each stage of his journey to the highest level. He's a two-time NBA All-Star, 12-year veteran, and a Denver Nuggets legend. Lafayette, Fat Lever, thanks for joining me. Hey, Adam. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to catching up with you and uh, seeing how a real podcast is done. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Some fans may already know. However, for the benefit of listeners that don't, do you mind briefly explaining the origin of your classic nickname? You know, that's one of the things. I don't think many people know Lafayette Lever at all. Everyone knows Fat Lever. But the origin comes from, I grew up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, and my younger brother could not pronounce Lafayette. So he actually called me Fat, which was spelled F-E-T-T, -T, like at the last part of my name. Mm -hmm. When I moved to Arizona in the fourth grade, everyone thought he was saying Fat, F-A-T. <laughs> from that point on, I was known as Fat Lever, and my brother would call me Fat. <laughs> for Lafayette. And so that's how the original of it came. And so to this day, many people would have no clue who Lafayette is or Fat, <laughs> but they'll know Fat Lever based on the NBA and ASU college days. That's a classic nickname and it's uh, stuck for a long time. Um, am I okay to call you Fat? Yes, please do, Adam. Thank you. Now, you were born in Arkansas uh, and when you were about 10 years old, your family moved to Tucson. This is in the early 1970s. Uh, not long after you began to play organized basketball. What do you remember about those early years and then learning the fundamentals of the game? I'll have to say those fundamental days came from my high school coach, and we had a team that won back-to-back -back state championships uh, in Tucson in the state of Arizona. And the thing that was most impressive about our team is every guy played every position. So if I was a point guard or two guard or three guard or four or five position, eventually I played the five position and the center ended up playing the one position. So we were always interchangeable. And one of the things that Coach Roland Levetter always taught us was the fundamentals. 
And from that, every day, we worked on the mic and drills. We worked on the Jerry West drills, the uh, old guy schools. Don't do a jump shot. You do a set shot until you master the set shot, the free throw. So the fundamentals came from my high school coach, where everyone actually eventually went on to a different college. But the groundwork was set there. But before the high school days, uh, I was a football player and played all sports. Didn't do well in many of them. And one was boxing that I really didn't like. But it always came back to basketball. And that was the one that I ended up staying with. So I tell kids every day, don't concentrate on one sport before you know what you really want to do. Just your foray into boxing, that ended pretty quickly when you copped a few punches to the head or what happened there? My cousin actually knocked me out at the Boise Girls Club and I realized <laughs> that it wasn't for me. So we spent a lot of time at the Boise Girls Club growing up. And so when I was in there boxing, you know, it got me in great shape for basketball and other sports. Because if you think about one of the things the coach used to tell me, get in the boxer stand to play defense. And I was like, well, I really don't want to get in the boxer stands because that brings back bad memories. <laughs> and so from that point on, I gave up boxing. And then I think when I got to high school, I played one, two years of football. And then it was like, it's over with. You're not made for football. You're not made for boxing. You better stick with basketball. It was a great choice. Um, now, in high school, and uh, I'll attempt to pronounce it, is it Pueblo Warriors? Yes. Once a warrior, always a warrior. There you go. In your junior season, you went 25-5, and five, and as you alluded to, you won back-to-back state titles in 1977 and 78. Uh, just for a bit of context for our listener, it was the team's first state title in 77. Uh, you were named the co-captain of the all-tournament team. You averaged more than 20 points a game across the tournament. And from what I have read, you were the only junior to be named to the all-city team that year as well. Uh, just what are a few of your memories from that first high school title, Fat? Well, you know, growing up in Tucson, everyone on our team, from my senior year to my freshman year, I played varsity as a sophomore. And so the freshman team that I originally started with never lost a game as their freshman team or their sophomore team. The only time they lost was when they got up to varsity. We lost five games in three years. And then in the senior year, we went undefeated. So well, of four years, I think the guys that were freshmen with me that didn't play on the varsity team lost only five games over a four years uh, period of time. So that's a very good memory that I have. And most of those guys I still see today in Tucson to the point where, you know, one of the best players on the team was Jeff Moore, who ended up playing over in the uh, Philippines under the Marcos regime. And he was considered the Michael Jordan of the Philippines back at that time. A lot of the guys came out and, of course, family still there. Uh, I still do a lot of things around the high school. They were at my jersey retirement at the Denver Nuggets. So Pueblo has a very strong foundation upon me, and I think that goes back to everyone on that team was really close and did a lot of things together because we didn't have much else to do. Great to see those links extended so many decades into the future, and we'll get to your uh, Jersey retirement, but we'll talk about that a bit later. Um, In between your high school junior and senior seasons, if I've read correctly, in around about August of 77, you went to a prestigious basketball camp in San Diego, and that is where you particularly had a lot of interest from college recruiters. I think you're one of only a handful of people from Arizona to attend. The rest of them were in California. Um, Do you remember that sports world camp and the impact that that had on your game going forwards? I do. I remember the sports world camp very well. I met one of my very dear friends. His name is Greg Gorgian, who was actually a freshman with me at Arizona State University. And Greg was Mr. Everything in California, averaging over 40 points a game and came with me to ASU as freshman, and I met him at the Superstars uh, camp in San Diego. And one of the things I remember so vivid and so much fun about that was I hadn't spent time on the beach. And at Point Loma College, the college was right on the beach. They had cliffs that looked over into the water, into the ocean. So every evening, Greg would take me over there and tell me, hey, this is what the beach does. This is what the ocean can do. Don't get too close to it. But So he gave me those type of experience, and that was probably the founding time really explore outside of Arizona basketball and see what everyone else was doing wow I remember the conquistadors from Tucson Arizona paying for me to be able to go over there to do that oh okay fantastic well Gorgian he he must be the brother of Brian Gorgian do you know Brian Gorgian yes that's his brother the Gorgian family have a a deep history within Australian basketball and Brian Gorgian particularly is uh, probably the most well-known of the Gorgian brothers here in Australia so yeah there you go it's a small world Yep, and 
Brian and all those guys and his dad was the coach for him when he was at Locker Center High School in LA. Right. And so then Greg transferred to go to UNLV, stayed a couple years there, and then from there went to uh, Loyola Marymount, where his dad coached him again his senior year. Great to hear your uh, experiences with these guys. Um, now, in 1978, as a high school senior, you led the Warriors to a 28-0 and record, that second straight title. You had 28 points and seven rebounds in the final, which is fantastic. And across the season, averaged 20 points, 12 boards, and about nine and a half assists. So almost that walking triple-double we were talking about. A couple of other quick things for our listener to know. You were also named the All-City Team Captain. And on that squad, you had a couple of your teammates from your high school team, which was great. I think uh, Jeff Moore and Tony Mosley. Yes. Your coach, Roland Slovetta, was also selected as All-City Coach. On top of that, just for good measure, you got the Class 3A Player of the Year. So that's one heck of a way to close out a high school career. What do you remember about that second straight title and celebrating with uh, all your friends and family? Well, we knew that the pressure was on us. And it was one of those things where everyone did their part. We knew that we had a bullseye on our back. That was one of the times where we actually had to slow the game down in the finals because we got to the game so low, didn't have a chance to warm up. So when you get to certain games, you know how to prepare for them. And if one guy wasn't there, then another one stepped up. And you talked about Tony Mosley and Jeff Moore. I mentioned him earlier about being overseas playing in the Philippines. Tony and Danny Mosley were brothers that were on the team too. And Tony was the other all-star. So to this day, We all get back at their birthday times or special events at Pueblo and celebrate it. Jeff just came back from Mexico to spend some time down in Pueblo because his family's there and his brother is a uh, coach over at Tucson High School. So he spends a lot of time over there with coaching. So still very familiar with those guys. And we had a great time at them. And that's something that I'll never forget. Some fantastic achievements. And to do that at a high school level uh, to set up the rest of your career is, uh, is fantastic. You mentioned there about one of the games you turned up you didn't have much time to warm up. I read in one of the articles that there was a really heavy downpour and some of the roads got washed out, causing you to arrive just before tip-off. Semi-final game, I think it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's the game. And that was at ASU because before the river bottom was put the way it is now, it's one of those things where the rain came in, wiped out some of the bridges, and it took us a couple of hours to go uh, a couple of miles. So when we got there, it was like, okay, we got to come over some other routine. And that's where Coach Lavera came out and threw up his expertise and says, hey, we'll figure out something. Just be ready to play when the ball goes up. He came up with a strategy. And I think a lot of people to this day talk about it. And one of the other guys is Coach uh, Royce Urey, who coached me on the USA Olympic junior team, was one of the, I guess, greatest coaches in the Phoenix area, where I consider Coach Lavera one of the best coaches in Arizona. and over Tucson by far. If I'm not mistaken, in that game where you had the, the washout of some of the roads, you sealed victory with about 40 seconds left. You hit a couple of free throws, came through when it mattered. Um, in April of 1978, you signed a letter of intent to attend Arizona State University. I read that there was more than 100 colleges that were chasing your signature. I think you visited six schools before you chose ASU. What was it that led you to the Sun Devils over some of those other schools, Fat? You know, I was a homebody. I hadn't been away from home, been out of Arizona except for going to Arkansas, where I grew up and would go back there. And I think one of the things my high school counselor recommended for me was to take all six visits and see what the rest of the world is like. And so I got a chance to do that. And after taking those visits, going back as far as Michigan State, uh, when Magic was there, getting a chance to see the snow that was all built up, and I realized I didn't like that. (laughs) Uh, Going to Utah, Utah State to visit there, going to Colorado, visiting there. And then ultimately choosing Arizona State because I think it was close to home, but it was far enough away for me to get away and grow up without having everyone being dependent upon you. So once I made that decision and knowing Coach Wolk and his beliefs and Coach Howard and Coach Newman and what they were doing, I thought it was the right place for me. And, you know, there was times once I got there, I wasn't quite sure, but it lasted and it was probably the best choice for me. Now, you mentioned Magic Johnson there, who was still probably just at the tail end of his college career before he went to the Lakers. But who were maybe a couple of players that you admired either at, um, well, if not the collegiate level before you got to college in the NBA? You know, I guess when I was in college at ASU, uh, Isaiah Thomas was always a favorite of mine. and I say that because he was playing on the Olympic team and the trainer for us at ASU was a guy by the name of Troy Young. 
And Troy was the trainer for Isaiah Thomas. And when he came back after working with the Olympic team, Troy was saying so many great things about Isaiah Thomas as far as how much of a competitor he was, how smart he was, how he went about getting things done on the court and how everyone listened to him. And he was like, if you're going to be a true point guard at any level, those are the things you have to look up to and be able to do. So I would say Isaiah Thomas on that level, but growing up in Tucson, once again, I had a guy by the name of Randall Moore, which was Jeff's older brother, to me was one of the influences as far as playing basketball. And one of the things that he would always say is, you know, it's hard to find role models that you see on TV because you don't know what they go through each and every day. Mm. Role models to me were people around that I saw that I could see when they had bad times. I could see when they had good times and understood that everything you see on TV isn't always as nice as we think it is. Yeah, that's true. As a freshman, your Sun Devils went 16 and 14. You missed just one game and averaged about 13 minutes a contest. Um, How did you find the adjustment from high school to college in that first season? It was tough. (laughs) It was really tough, Adam, because we had seniors on the team that were really great players. And we had some uh, freshmen, including myself and Greg Gorgian, Tom Kuyper, and Dale Cook. So we were freshmen on the team. And many times, not to be cocky, but we thought we were better than the seniors. So you always think you're better than other players. And Coach Wilk had to do a great job of calming us down to say, hey, seniors win basketball games for us. You guys will get us here to win a few games, but the seniors are ultimately going to win the games for us. And I think that's one of the things that Greg Gorgian didn't really accept because he knew that he and I were some of the better players on the team, but Coach Wilk had his standards that, hey, seniors play, freshmen wait their time because before then, remember, some freshmen weren't allowed to play before we got there in the college level. So uh, I understood that because I thought about transferring at different times and uh, Greg eventually transferred during the uh, summer of our freshman year. I stayed with it. And fortunately enough, it worked out for the best for both of us. How close were you to actually considering a move to another school? Was that in your freshman year only or into your sophomore season too? Nope, not in my sophomore season, just my freshman year because Greg and I were roommates and we were talking about it and we were close. And we didn't know if we would get a chance to play our sophomore years because of the dynamics of more seniors being ahead of us and Coach Wilk's loyalty to veteran players. Um, so we didn't know if we would get, ever get a chance to play. And so finally, when that opportunity came, we became seniors at different schools. And it was one of those things that you go through. It was a test. I look back at it as a test. And to this day, Coach Wilk, Lord rest his soul, was one of the best things he could ever do uh, was to say, hey, I'm going to make you sit here and learn. If you can sit here and be patient enough to learn on the bench, when you get in the game, you'll be a bit more prepared for it. That paid massive dividends because in your sophomore season, your role increased significantly. The team went 22-7 and seven and you played every game, uh, averaging almost 10 points, more than four rebounds and almost five assists. Your minutes went up to about 34 minutes per contest. You also made the NCAA tournament for the first time uh, and you defeated Loyola Marymount, a team you referenced a few minutes ago, uh, before losing out to Ohio State. How was that first trip to the big dance? You know, it's fun. And and the thing that I always remember about Ohio State, who had all the best players, and Clark Kellogg was on that team, and there's an old photo of he and I. And when Clark was with the Pacers, and then after our NBA careers, we kind of stayed in touch from the broadcasting. So I look back at those days and says, you know, when I was a sophomore and that team came out, I thought that was the most loaded college team around at the time. And then when I got to my junior year and Saw some of the guys like Alton Lister, uh, Johnny Nash, and Byron Scott, and myself, and Curtin Nymphius. And I kind of compared our team to that team because I thought they were college players that had great chances of doing well at the NBA level. Sam Williams was also a member of your team as well. Yep. Slam and Sam. I had a look at that Ohio State team, and you mentioned uh, Clark Kellogg. They had Calvin Rancy as well, and, and Herb Williams. So... Future pros left, right, and center between the two teams there. Granville Waiters. There you go. Yeah, loaded. In your junior season, it was probably the best season that you had whilst you were there in terms of how the team went. Uh, 24 and 4, and you won 16 of your last 17 games, including a huge win over Oregon State to finish the regular season, and that stopped them from having an undefeated season. Um, that team featured Steve Johnson, who's also a, a recent guest of the podcast. You again made it to the NCAA tournament before losing out to Kansas. 
how would you rate that season? You average about uh, 11 and a half points, five rebounds, and over five assists per game. Adam, that was one of the greatest teams I think to ever come through Arizona State University, mm. even to this day. And I'm a little biased, <laughs> but I can say that because <laughs> those guys were the ones I mentioned earlier for myself and Byron, Alton Lister, Kurt Nymphius, Sam Williams. So we've mentioned those guys that all went on to play in the NBA, and Steve Johnson had a similar team. You know, Mark Radford, Ray Bloom, and Steve Johnson himself. That game and that year probably was the most satisfying because we accomplished a lot during the season and ended up losing in the early rounds of the NCAA tournament, which was devastating. But you look back at that team, and the old saying was, at that time, maybe there was not enough basketballs to go around to make that team as good as it really was. <laughs> Getting to your senior season, you had a great individual season. You were the team captain and MVP, and you averaged more than 16 points, five rebounds, and almost four assists a game. The team went 13 and 14, and on the 20th of February, I read about a game where you went for 38 points and had seven steals against Arizona, which I believe would have been a, a rival, uh, to say the least. <laughs> which is the most points by a Sun Devil versus Arizona in the history of the series, from what I understand. Hmm. Do you recall that game uh, and particularly how well you performed against uh, a rival in Arizona? I do because that was not just a rival, but I always had to go back home and play there because during the summertime, I lived in Tucson. Uh -huh. The U of A guys were there, and so they were always criticizing me as a trader, as this or that, but I was always welcome to go back. So to have a career high against Arizona, outstanding achievements for me that I would be you know, really proud of. And to go back and you know everyone from your high school is going to be there, your old teammates are going to be there. So it was always a special game to play Arizona, whether it's at ASU or at the U of A. And then when I would go home, I have a special history with the University of Arizona because my junior high school basketball coach actually was supposed to go to U of A with the Kitty Court group that had Eric Money, Cole Neal Norman, John Irving, Bob Elliott, and Jim Rappus that many people don't know. And those are the things that he didn't make the squad at the U of A, so he became our junior high school basketball coach. And those guys that came from Detroit with him would come over when I was in the eighth grade and play pickup basketball with us. So when I got to the college level, those guys were still around. I got a chance to play with them and uh, learned a lot from them. And the one that was the coach was uh, Fred Snowden, and many people knew him as one of the first original black coaches at, in, the, in college games. So a um, lot of history there, not just because of the rivalry, because what it meant to be playing against the University of Arizona as far as the rivalry goes, it states itself. It's one of the most competitive games, and every other game doesn't count until that one is played and is over with. <laughs> and how is the crowd? Always, no matter what your record was, there's always going to be a crowd for <laughs> for rivalry, just like in football. We see the crowds there where you may get 20, 30,000 during the course of the year, but that game, uh, football and basketball, it's always going to be a sellout. And you just hope you have more of your colored jerseys at home or in the stands than the opposing team does. Understood. <laughs> Understood. Uh, just for a bit of context to round out your career at ASU, you were the leader in assists and steals as a sophomore, junior, and senior, which is outstanding. And you closed out your career there by getting Associated Press second team All-American honors as well. You left college averaging more than 10 points, four rebounds, almost four assists, and over two steals a game. And you currently rank third all-time in steals and fourth in assists. So just some wonderful numbers there and some great achievements individually and as a team. Just looking back on those four seasons at Arizona State, is there a a fondest memory that you can think of that might spring to mind? There's a lot of special moments. I think uh, the one thing that really stands out is a guy by the name of Lionel Hollins, who was there before me. And one of the things that was always compared to was I was supposed to be the next Lionel Hollins. And I had no idea who Lionel Hollins was until I really got to the NBA <laughs> and watched him play with the Portland Trail Blazers, become a great coach and do those special things, but I think that's one of the things that surprised me that I never thought would happen was I was prepared to someone that I didn't even know, and he was a left-handed player, and I wasn't even left-handed, so I think those were one of the surprise moments that most people doesn't realize. In April of 1982, you attended the Aloha Classic in Hawaii, and you made the all-tournament team. Um, 
what do you remember of that trip and its importance to you with the NBA draft only being a few months away? You know, I think that was probably my coming out party because it was a time where you got a chance to play with the best of the best, uh, opposed to where the seniors were always there and you played against the seniors and the veteran guys. And it goes back to what Coach Wook would say, you know, seniors win games. So when you're playing in the Hawaii Classic Tournament, that was where the best of the seniors were because a lot of guys weren't coming out early Mm. at that point in time. So you were playing with the best and you had a chance to play with them, not just one day, but uh, at different times during the course of the weeks that you were over there. You know, one of the guys from UCLA was uh, Mike Sanders, who became a good friend of mine that I played against with him in college. But when we were over there at the uh, uh, tournament, we got a chance to bond and you get a chance to meet guys that you played against. But now you saw them in a different atmosphere. And I thought that was one of the best things you were able to do. I love going to Hawaii because I, I was recruited by there. It didn't go, but I always had a great time over there. The NBA draft itself in 1982 was in late June. Uh, the Portland Trailblazers selected you with the 11th overall pick. Where were you on draft day and how did it feel when you heard your name called? You know, I was actually at the draft. So I was there. And I was decked out looking good, too. <laughs> I tried to find the clips on YouTube of the 82 draft, but there's only select clips, but that's the one where James Worthy went number one. Correct. So what do you recall about that day, and, and uh, what were you wearing on the day? I was dressed out in shirt slacks and no jacket and all this stuff, but the thing that I remember most about it was Scott Hastings. And one of the guys that went to college with who was Sparky the Sun Devil, he was there to draft because he was from New York. And so Scott Hastings and I were there. We got a chance to know each other from the Junior Olympic days. And he was expected to go really high up in the draft and did. You know, that happens occasionally. But the next day when we were leaving to go back home at the airport, it was so crowded and so congested. Scott thought he was going to miss his flight. So he jumped out of the car to run to the airport (laughs) (laughs) to get there in time to catch his flight because of the turmoil that happened the day before. So. I think those were the fun memories because it made it fun. It wasn't work. It wasn't things worried about, you know, who you're going to get drafted by. And I remember Sleepy Floyd sitting there and we're talking about, hey, you're going to go to this team, you're going to go to that team. No one really knew. And the exposure from the media coverage was nowhere close to where it is now. So everyone was just guessing. And the agents that we had represent us, Fred Slaughter, who was a great agent for me, and a great friend to this day. I'm still great friends with his family and his uh, great grandkids. So uh, just a blessing to be there and to experience. And that was my first time being in New York. What a way to do it too. Some other All-Stars that were drafted in 82 included Terry Cummings, uh, Dominic Wilkins, you mentioned Sleepy Floyd, Ricky Pierce, uh, Mark Eaton, and uh, obviously yourself. We'll get to your All-Star nods uh, a bit later on. You mentioned the Junior Olympics Is this in like 1979, ahead of the 1980 games that eventually were boycotted? What do you recall from that experience and some of the guys you were mixing with then that maybe gone on to the pros? You know, that was one where uh, James Worthy was the star of the team, of course. Uh, Scott Hastings was on that team. We had a guy by the name of Fred Roberts, who was my favorite guy, that was on the team. Uh, So myself, a lot of guys on that team didn't make it to the – Olympics, but we did our qualifying in Colorado Springs, which was the sports festival time. To be able to go by and compete against a lot of guys, just treasured memories. But the funnest part was a guy by the name of Fred Roberts that they called Lurch, who was coming from uh, BYU and was my roommate. And we just had the best of times because he was just so easygoing and just had the time of his life wherever he went. And he was a 6'10 guy that stood out wherever he went and he had that deep voice like Lurch from the Adams family. <laughs> <laughs> Just a marvelous guy. So he made it worthwhile for me on that trip. And I had another coach by the name of Royce Yuri, who was with us on that trip, who was coaching high school in Phoenix at the time that I mentioned earlier. And he and I was just like kids in nowhere land because we were in Brazil for the games and would not eat the food because we're not used to eating <laughs> foreign food and we were just less used to eat Mexican food and uh, the foods that we were growing up eating chicken and fish and steaks and they brought out a full roasted pig that looked like it was still alive. Uh, <laughs> our appetites wasn't there. <laughs> so. Now, in terms of your MBA career, 
with the Blazers, you spent two seasons there and you averaged almost nine points, five assists and two steals a game in about 24, 25 minutes per night. You missed just one regular season game in each of those seasons. There was a super quote that I came across when researching for our chat today and you were talking about when you were learning the offense of the Blazers coach, the legendary Jack Ramsey. Quote, with him, you either have to know what you're doing or be great at faking it. (laughs) <laughs> which I thought was fantastic. What impact did Dr. Jack have on your early pro career and just how did you adjust to the highest level after playing you know, those four seasons at ASU? I always say Jack Ramsey taught me how to play in the NBA and Doug Moe let me play in the NBA. And I say Jack taught me because he was a disciplinarian and practice were always so intense And that's where you have to learn to play or fake it to get through the practice because if you didn't understand it, you did it over and over and over again until you did get it. Uh And Jack was a maniac as far as a physical, healthy, eating guy that wanted to compete with the players. And so that's why I think when you saw how intense he was and he knew the game. So being in Portland in a small market, as far as the city goes, but a big market because it was the only game in town. It was like being in New York. And it was the atmosphere that everybody loved the Blazers and everyone supported them. You had the lifestyle of a, of a superstar in a small town. That was better than going to the big city, coming from Tucson, Arizona, not knowing what to expect from a big city like New York or Chicago. So it was probably the best place that I could have been drafted to to be able to learn under Jack Ramsey and for him to give me that tutelage as far as, okay, go out and play, do this. And one of the assistant coaches was Jim Lynham and also Barry Bugwalter, who were also additional coaches and mentors to the older guys. Mm -hmm. And Rick Adelman was a graduate assistant at the time that no one knew we worked for free, but he was the one that would always come up with some great plays. And learning from Rick was one of the things that I always cherish as well. Excellent to hear. And uh, Rick, of course, would go on to coach the Blazers in the late 80s uh, into the 90s after he took over from Mike Shuler. Um, So Dr. Jack actually would get involved in some of the scrimmages, would he, when you were doing practices? He would always interrupt them, not participate in them. But if we were working out guy, and one of the things that he always loved to do was swim. So if we had a tough practice, a practice going twice a day, he'd always make the guys go swim. Uh And that was one of the things he did for conditioning and to relax the muscles. And he was an avid swimmer. So whenever you started doing something wrong in practice, he was quick to get in and stop and make you do it again and over and over and over again. So those are the things that made you a better player because you had to perfect them. And that's what Jack was, a perfectionist. And also one of the better dressed guys that people didn't realize until it was too late. It looked corny at the time, but now you look back, that style still exists. There's some vintage clips of him that are on YouTube and you see some of the outfits he's wearing and uh, they're, they're fantastic. Um, now, in early June of 84, Portland traded you along with uh, Wayne Cooper, uh, Calvin Natt, and I think a few picks to Denver in exchange for Kiki Vandeweghe. How did you react upon learning of the trade and a move to the, the much more up-tempo style of the Denver Nuggets? I knew what a trade was but wasn't expecting it and I was so happy it happened during the summertime so I could prepare and get ready to a new city, opposed to, you know, if you traded in mid-season, you got to be there in 48 hours. Mm. And I had two guys, Calvin Nat and Wayne Cooper, who had been through trades before. So all I did was follow everything that they laid out. Wherever they were going, I was going. Whatever they said was happening. So being traded with them, it made it easier transition for me because they had been through it before, and I hadn't. Back then, that trade was basically a five-for-one the two other picks that were thrown in to go to Denver. I think at that point in time, I don't think any other team had made a trade that big. And the start of the team of the trade was Calvin Nat and, of course, Kiki. And we know what numbers they put up in their careers. And Wayne Cooper was our unsung hero most of the times and always did the dirty work. Someone has to do it, don't they? I don't want to embarrass you. However, I was messaging with um, Pete Babcock ahead of this chat today. <laughs> For those that are unaware, he's a great uh, former NBA executive. I asked him about you, and uh, he's told me it was okay for me to say this. So he said in reply, quote, I've known Fat since he was in college and worked our summer basketball camps as a counsellor. When I was just hired in Denver, we were offered a choice of Fat or Darnell Valentine. 
I told Vince, our team president, that we definitely wanted fat. <laughs> in our six years together in Denver, I felt that fat was our MVP. Not our most heralded player, but our most valuable. He did everything. He defended, scored, rebounded, and assisted. And when he played, we were hard to beat. When he got hurt versus Dallas in the playoffs one year, we ended up losing the series. But with him, we were on our way to a second Western Conference Finals. Now, I know it's perhaps difficult to respond to such glowing praise. However, it does sum up your impact perfectly, especially on that Nuggets team. Um, How would you sort of respond to the relationship you had with Pete uh, that goes back many decades? Well, Adam, that goes way far before the Denver Nuggets days. I worked with Pete at the Adams Westfall basketball camp at Central Arizona College. Oh, wow. So Alvin Adams and Paul Westfall, yeah. Mm -hmm. So they had their camps. Howard Slusher was their agent. And I got a chance to know Pete and his family because they were Maryvale High School superstars, which is another high school in the Phoenix area. And Rob, Pete, and Dave were there before me. So I got a chance to know who they were from a distance. Uh, I got a chance to know Pete because the first time I ever came across Pete outside of the uh, Adams Westfall basketball camp, he was actually with the uh, San Diego Clippers. Uh And when I was in college, Paul Howard asked him on my behalf if I should leave ASU and try to go to the pros earlier. Oh, Pete was like, no, hell no. (laughs) (laughs) So that honesty was one of the things that I've always had with, not just with Pete, but with Rob, who, you know, was his brother, and Dave, who's still with the uh, Milwaukee Bucks to this day. I saw Pete at his brother's uh, services. So the Babcock name in Arizona is very strong and vivid, as strong as it is in the NBA, because a lot of the brothers came through there and coached and were executives and scouts in different uh, executive positions with teams. But I think my memories go further back than the Denver Nuggets. And the Denver Nuggets days were some good old days, especially when we look at all those old team posters oh. that Pete's in and myself <laughs> and the team shots. Pete wanted to do those, and the guys loved them. Do you have many of those posters left? I do. We look back and say, do you have this one? And the one with the fur coats. I still have that fur coat that we wore. That's great. There's so many good ones. And there's ones where I think you guys are wearing like hard hats and you've got lunch pails and... Uh, Lunch bucket would be great. That's it. That's it. There's some fantastic ones there. Yeah, that's great. Well, I'm glad that um, your history with Pete and the Babcock family obviously goes back a long way. And uh, I thank Pete for just taking time out to even share those really kind words about... uh, the impact that you've had on him and uh, obviously uh, the league in general, especially in Denver. 1985 was the deepest run that you had in the NBA playoffs. Uh, The Nuggets disposed of San Antonio and Utah before you met the LA Lakers in the Western Conference Finals. LA would obviously go on to beat Boston in the NBA Finals. What are a few of your memories of playing against those Showtime Lakers teams that also happened to feature your former college teammate Byron Scott? You start trying to get bragging rights for Byron and I because he was in Showtime. He grew up in L.A. and from Inglewood High School. And a lot of the people from ASU realized that. And his team was always the favorite. And so we would have not grudge matches, but proving matches that we still belonged. And fortunate enough for him, he won uh, championship rings. I did not. I had all-star rings. He did not. So that's what I always throw back at him. <laughs> that's fair. Those were great times because the motion of the game was up and down and, you know, Magic with his flash and Kareem, I got a chance to see them. And one of the things that I mentioned earlier in regards to Fred Slaughter, my agent, he also represented Michael Cooper. So Michael Cooper was on those teams. So I got a chance to get to know him. And when the Lakers were coming in and play the Suns when I was at ASU my senior year, I got a chance to go and watch some of the games uh, from a distance. Magic first year. And, of course, Cream had been there for a while. So now I had a chance to play against them in the playoffs and see some of those special moments. And being in in the old arena, sports arena, was different than being in the uh, Staples Center now because that crowd was exciting and flashy. And Magic was the showman all over the place. He was uh, one of those guys that really brought basketball fashion and style with Showtime back to the NBA that was outstanding. The 1980s uh, NBA, 
What a fantastic era it was, and you were a massive part of that as well. Um, in the 1986 season, you lost the Western Conference semifinals to would-be NBA finalists, the Houston Rockets. Uh, I decided to quickly touch on the 87 season. At only six foot three, you led your team in rebounding, which is remarkable in itself. I found a great Sports Illustrated article referencing your 87 season. Quote, Fat outdid two-thirds of the NBA's starting centers in terms of rebounds, including 10 seven-footers. Um, that says it all, really. Where did your tenacity for grabbing rebounds come from? Well, remember in high school, every player played each position on the team. So sometimes I was the center on our team. And our tallest guy on our championship teams in high school was Jeff Moore at 6'4", 6'5". So every guy played every position. And to me, it was like when I was a point guard playing on the perimeter, my lesson was that every loose ball was my ball. And that meant a long rebound. That meant a ball that was uh, falling on the floor that someone was on a turnover. So every time the ball came up, it was supposed to be mine. And that was one of the mindsets that I had, and I think that was part of the rebounding. And then when I got to the pros, I realized that, hey, if you get the rebound, it's easy to get it up the court and run the way Denver wanted to play. It all started when I was in high school. It's a rarity, really, because um, not a lot of players will take that from high school and continue it into the higher levels. They might do it when they were younger, but uh, not often when they turn pro, they're going to continue to have that much tenacity. So uh, an outstanding quality of yours throughout your career. In 1987, you were overlooked for an all-star nod, but your teammate, Hall of Fame great Alex English, offered to give you his spot, which is remarkable. Uh, The NBA didn't allow it. How did you react to that when Alex first floated that suggestion? If you know Alex, he would give you anything, give you the skin off his back. And that's what a true leader would do because he realized uh, you miss out on certain things. But if you go back and remember some of the all-star games before where he had the winning teams donate their winnings uh, to overseas to South Africa. True. So Alex has done so many things for so many, and that's why he is the legend that he is on and off the court. He's our kingpin. So I would expect nothing less of him to do something like that. But of course, he's just as deserving because he's the pillar and the strength of our team, no matter what you say. Because when things are going bad, he's not going to yell and scream at you. Um, but he was that silent leader and he led by example and those was the perfect things that you want from a leader and a leader would do something like that by make, offering his position. That's just Alex and that's what he does as a kingpin. An outstanding gesture and uh, one that obviously he, he meant it wasn't just a token offer, clearly. In March of 1987, the great um, Jack McCallum of Sports Illustrated named you a lock for SI's first NBA all underrated team. Um, How was your relationship with the media throughout your career, Fat? I think it was good. I had a media jinx for myself, though. I never wanted to do an interview the day before the game so it would come out in the press the next morning because I'd see the clippings and realize that if I said something that offended someone else on the opposing team, they would come after me for it. Ah. So I always had that bias that I didn't want to do an interview before, but I I would do them. And my relationship with the media was great. The only time I ever had an issue was uh, one year in Dallas, and it was something that was taken out of content. And I apologized to Quinn Buckner for this because he was the coach of the team, and I was the captain of the team in Dallas. And something was written in the press that someone said I had said, and it wasn't quoted, supposed to have been quoted by me. So Quinn asked me about it, and I was like, hey, call the reporter. Get him on the phone, (laughs) because it wasn't me that said this. And so I think that's the only time I've ever had any problems with them. And to this day, I understand the media better, because I do some of the broadcasting for the Nuggets games, and I was doing some in Sacramento. Uh, I don't like a lot of exposure, but I know it comes with the territory. Well said. Thanks for elaborating. Now, in that 87 season, you were named to the All-NBA second team, which is a, a great honor. How did that feel to receive the, the well-earned recognition after numerous seasons where um, what you were doing seemed to be just going uh, too much under the radar? I think, you know, being in a city such as Denver and not being as popular as the Broncos were at the time. So I took that as it was. Never got offended by it. And at some point in time, you knew your time was going to come and acknowledge it because one of the things that 
different people will say there's always going to be someone left off an all-star team, an all-NBA team, or some award show that they think they deserve to be on. And as long as you continue to do what you were supposed to be doing, your time is going to come. In 87, you were ousted in the first round of the playoffs by the Lakers, who would go on again to win the NBA title. Uh, In terms of the 88 season, just want to quickly touch on one particular game in the early season. It was a 132-104 to victory you had over New Jersey. Your stats for that game were 21 points, 13 rebounds, 14 assists, and 8 steals. You were just too shy of a quadruple double. Um, I mentioned in the intro that you were often known as a triple-double waiting to happen. Uh, the 1980s is obviously you know, well removed from today's era of analytics and obsessing over numbers. Mm-hmm. What do you sort of make of the emphasis that's placed on, on the stats today versus what players would just naturally achieve in the course of a game during the 1980s? I think that's a major challenge, Adam. And I say that because certain guys play for stats mm. opposed to playing for wins and losses. And today, because there is so many statistical categories that people want to achieve, whether it's passing um, Kobe Bryant in points, that's a given. It's going to happen as long as you go out and score. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to keep track of it. Everyone else is. I believe that the analytics has its place, but I don't think there's any replacement for someone who just goes out and plays hard and leaves it all out on the floor. And I think uh, Russell Westbrook was one of those guys who gets his stats. And he may play for stats, but I don't think anyone plays as hard. And Calvin Natt was one of the guys that never took a a playoff or a minute off and had all the injuries. And one thing that Magic said when I was getting these triple doubles, and he was as well because he was the original leader, Mm -hmm. and he said, you're 6'3", I'm 6'9". I will last at this game a lot longer than you will because I don't have to jump as high, run as far, (laughs) and do as much. And I think that was one of the things that – comes out as a compliment because now one of your peers who recognized as a triple-double king is now telling you some of the same things that you're already achieving. Fantastic answer. Great to hear this sort of stuff. Uh, And Magic, coming from one of the all-time greatest players as well, that must mean a lot too. It does. Especially that's peers and they know the hard players just like if I say something about Russell Westbrook. Mm. I'm a fan. I hate it when he broke my records and all this stuff, but... (laughs) And when I saw him at UCLA play, and I'm supporting ASU, I did have no idea that this kid played that hard every play on the court. Yeah, he has a lot of uh, intensity to say the absolute least. Yes. Just in terms of your numbers throughout uh, a period of time in Denver, between the 87 and 90 NBA seasons, your averages over that time were 18.9 points, 8.9 rebounds, 7.5 assists, and 2.5 steals per game. So just absolutely phenomenal and uh, very close to averaging a triple-double across four seasons, which, yeah, just quite remarkable. Um, You were voted to be a starter on the 1988 NBA All-Star Game in Chicago. Uh, In that game, you had uh, a great performance too, 17 points, four rebounds and three assists in just 31 minutes. Um, The same Sports Illustrated article that I referenced earlier dubbed your impact on the Nuggets as, quote, Rocky Mountain lever fever. (laughs) <laughs> which I thought was pretty funny and very clever. Um, how did it feel to be named an all-star for that first time? And what sort of memories spring to mind from that weekend in Chicago? I was so nervous. I don't remember any of it. Outside of the basketball, because I was so focused, I don't even think I saw my godparents who were there for the game <laughs> during the course of everything that was going on. And I don't know if it was because there was so much going on. And once the game started, I was so happy. <laughs> Because it was like everything else was like torture because I had never been there before and all the hype of the game and being in the big city with Michael being there in his hometown and all the other things. And But once the game started, I was fine then because I remember in the locker room before the game, Pat Roddy was coaching the team and he says, OK, if you guys forget to play, just watch Alex and Fat play. <laughs> That's a good endorsement. Yeah, just watch them play because just run the plays run. They're just going to be running around anyways because no one thought we had plays. And in an all-star game, you don't really want to run plays, but you do, especially when it gets down to the last minute and you're trying to win the game. And those games were competitive. Yes, they were competitive. Yeah, well, back then, that's when the all-star game really mattered and players took it seriously. Of course, these days, it's more of an exhibition, basically. Correct. That game was a 138-133 victory for the East. It was really closely fought and a great crowd there in Chicago. You mentioned your godparents there. Your high school coach, 
he's one of your godparents, correct? Yes, he and his wife. So Roland and Beverly Levetta are my godparents, and, and you know, at the Jersey retirement, they're there, mm. and everything that pretty much I do, they're probably gonna, they're usually a part of it. Fantastic to hear. Um, now, in 1988 as well, you were named to the All Defensive Second Team that year. Also, you were inducted into the Arizona State Hall of Fame. I read whilst researching for our chat. It was also Denver's best record of that decade, going 54 and 28, and you won the Midwest Division uh, title. Do you look back on that season as one of the best that you had during the 80s there in, in Denver? Given the absence of, I guess, of a few key players throughout that season, I think Wayne Cooper and Calvin Natt were injured uh, throughout as well. You know, I'd look back and i say it was because of the record itself and with guys not being fully healthy. But I think and overall for the years that we were there, until Dikembe went to Denver and everyone started taking notice of their um, playoff run was notable. And I think to this day, no one has gotten a parade for a team in Denver than that team that you just brought up was the 80s team. Beloved at that time. <laughs> I looked up your career high on basketballreference.com in the NBA. You had 38 points. <laughs> to go along with that, you had 12 rebounds, seven assists, and four steals, mind you, against the Miami Heat in the 89 season. Um, does a game like that actually still reside in your memory banks, or are you more about just taking the W and moving on? You know, I took the W and moving on. I remember I was in, in Sacramento, and we were doing a broadcast, and someone brought up that number. And then Jerry Reynolds who was another broadcasting partner, general manager with the Sacramento Kings and still there to this day. He was like, well, you had 32 points in a half, so you just took the second half off of the game. <laughs> I was like, well, why you got to ruin it? Why can't I just have a great first half and have a great overall game? <laughs> and he says, you're never going to get off that easy with me. <laughs> that's what I remember about that. After the fact, Jerry Riddle's teasing me about it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, the final score was 117 to 92, so it was a blowout. You deserve to sit on the bench in the uh, second half, we'll say that. <laughs> um, in 1990, you were named an All-Star for the second time, and in that game, you had another really good performance. 16 points, three rebounds, two assists, and two steals in just 22 minutes. Um your Nuggets tenure ended that same season in 1990, as did Denver's uh, iconic coach, Doug Moe, uh, who left the franchise. How was that last season in Denver, and, and what was your relationship like with Doug over those previous seasons? You know, Doug was one of the coaches that I say was a player's coach. Doug was one of the best coaches and over my godparents, my godfather, and uh, high school coach. Doug Moe was the best at coming up with plays at the spur of the moment for the situation at hand and who was on the court. And you may have never ran that play during the course of, of a practice or anything like that, but if there was a play that was designed or needed, Doug would come up with something that no one had ever seen before. Hmm. I was mesmerized by that because everyone thought Doug was just like easy going, none dressing, throw the ball out and let him play. <laughs> but he always had a strategy as far as what was going on during the course of a game. He understood it. He knew what it was going to take to win. And one of the things that I admired about Doug was once the game was over, it was over. He didn't worry about it. He would talk about it and laugh and joke about you with it. And when he went to Philly and became Mr. Model Material Dressing Guy, <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised because he was just like changing and he changed for the best. And I think uh, he got the best from what he was doing. So Doug is one of the guys that most guys never had problems with him. And the assistant coaches, uh, whatever Doug didn't do, they wanted to do, and everybody supported him. So Doug was great for Denver, not just the Nuggets, but for Denver. I'm pleased to hear that. He seemed like such a character, and uh, it's good to hear from a former player and friend of his um, what he was like. Um, now, in June of 1990, Denver traded you to Dallas for, I think, a, a 1990 first-round pick. I think it was Willie Burton, actually, that was later selected. And then a 1991 first-round pick who turned out to be Le Bradford Smith. You spent the last four years of your career in Dallas. Uh, you missed the 1993 season with injury. Uh, the Mavs were really struggling in the early to mid-1990s after being a really good team throughout most of the 1980s. How was that transition from the strong Denver team uh, to a franchise that was sort of close to bottoming out and uh, trying to find its feet again? I look back at that thinking that Dallas had did something that was very special back then that no one really looked at. It was almost a superstar type of a team 
that was put together in Dallas. Unfortunately, I got hurt. Roy Tarpey got hurt. Mm. But Alex English was on that team. Rodney McRae was on that team. And then you look at guys that were superstars in their own rights already with that team. Guys like Derek Harper and Rolando Blackman. So think about that team. Some great players on there. That was one of the first, I think, all-star team that was gathered that could play. But the injuries hurt us because Roy got uh, his problems with being thrown out of the league. Mm -hmm. I got hurt and only played a few games. Uh, Derek was hurt. So we could never get a good routine of guys that could play. But if you had that team assembled as a healthy team, that was one of the best teams to be in the NBA because you would have Derek Harper as your point guard, Rolando Blackman as your two, Alex English as your three, Roy Tarpley as your four, James Donaldson as your five, Fat Lever and Rodney McCray coming off the bench with um, Brad Davis. That was a pretty good team, Adam, right there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We just could never get it. And then that following year, I missed the entire year. And Roy's out of the league. And so all the other problems come up. And I think when they put that team together, uh, Stu and those guys, when they put that team together, it was one of those teams that was ready to do it. But other things happen off the court that you can't control with your injuries and players not being smart. I appreciate you uh, going into some depth there about some of the struggles behind the scenes there. But uh, yeah, certainly there's a, a great collection of players and had they been healthy, as you said, uh, who knows what you could have achieved. On September the 2nd of 94, you were released by the Mavericks. It's impossible to do justice to your post-NBA playing days uh, in the limited time we have left, and I really appreciate the time you've afforded uh, me today. Mm -hmm. However, here's just a few of the great achievements you've had since then. In 1996, you finished your degree at ASU. In 2004, you were inducted into the Pac-10 Hall of Honor. In 2013, you were inducted into the Arizona Sports Hall of Fame. Um, what I'd love to briefly touch on is the event that we talked about earlier, your jersey retirement in 2017, I think it was, um, as part of the Nuggets' 50th anniversary celebrations. It was Fat Lever Night, and they retired your famous number 12 to the rafters. Before we get to that, though, uh, the team surprised you with their plans to have the jersey retirement, and that happened in front of the current roster and coaching staff a few weeks prior, I believe it was. Mm -hmm. um, how surprised were you that that was planned, and, and how did you react I know there's a clip on YouTube where it shows some of that happen. How did you feel to, to know that your number was going to be honored for the rest of time? I was honored for the number to be retired and what happened. But the surprise shouldn't just come from me because everyone else in the arena should be surprised that someone could hold that big of a secret <laughs> for the couple of weeks leading into it. So you had absolutely no idea? No idea whatsoever. None. <laughs> I had never met Josh. <laughs> and Lisa <laughs> Johnson and Tim Connolly and AK and all the guys that were around there was talking and none whatsoever. And to do it like at a practice where you're sitting around, <laughs> I know someone in that front office just had to, Loretta Harmon or somebody. <laughs> so the secret of no one else knowing about it, and I was there the day before the practice started. And usually some type of media sneaks out or leaks out or something, <laughs> but nothing. So the surprise was taken off guard by me. And then with all pressures of being so excited to have it being done, oh, yeah, I was in hog heaven. <laughs> oh, that's great. Uh, in terms of the night itself, Fat Lever Night, um, that looked like a fantastic celebration. Uh, your image was superimposed on the court. They had the old school Denver Nuggets logo at one end of the court. You were surrounded by friends and family, uh, all your loved ones, grandkids, everything. Uh, your godparents. Um, can you just uh, describe how you felt uh, being honored and then seeing that uh, jersey get retired up into the rafters? I was excited. I was ready for that moment. And I think everything that was leading up to it, where I had my family there, I had kids that were in the broadcasting class from my high school there doing the same thing so everything leading up to it adam i was ready for that night to get there because they and i had some peace and quiet <laughs> <laughs> because everything else leading up to it was preparations and making sure everybody was going to have a good time and making sure you're going to enjoy yourself and once it was there i really got a chance to sit back relax and enjoy it and to be able to share it and see it and I always say, if I could dance, I would have danced the first night that 
they surprised me with the jersey announcement and then danced that second night at the jersey retirement. <laughs> but I can't dance. <laughs> <laughs> I would have liked to have seen that. And also your great friend Alex English uh, had some words to share ahead of the presentation as well, which were really heartfelt too. Oh, yeah. You know, he's written books. So whatever comes out of his mouth, you know it's going to be so eloquent and sincere because that's just what he can do. You know, when he talk about the movies and the things that he's done off the court, for one of the guys that you want to present and for what he's done for the Nuggets, I was very thrilled to have him be able to present. Well, thank you for sharing all these uh, moments and memories from your career. Just two last quick questions, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Basketball Digest had a regular feature, which was called The Game I'll Never Forget. Um, We may have touched on it already, but is there a single game from your career that stands out the most? I think the one, and it was on a bad note and a good note. Mm -hmm. And I was in Dallas, and we were playing in Chicago, and I was getting ready. I had an opportunity to score my 10,000 points. And based on injuries, I didn't do it in that game, and I was able to do it when we got back to Dallas. And I thought about what if I had gotten hurt and I would have never gotten a chance to do that because I didn't do it in the game before. Oh. So that was one, probably the two games that I think that stands back and say, what do you remember most about it? All the accolades are written in print and, and are showcased. But that's the one that sticks out in my mind because that was one of my goals that I really wanted to achieve my last year in the league was to score 10,000 points leave the game healthy, and have my kids be able to see me play. And I almost missed it out because of not doing it in Chicago. Did you get the game ball from that particular game when you scored the 10,000th point? I did, and Mr. Carter, who was the owner of the time, uh, really did a great plaque and awards for me. So it was outstanding. So yes, I do have that ball and that plaque. Fantastic to hear. Do you have much memorabilia that you've kept from your playing days? You know, not the important, valuable stuff. But the little knickknacks, like I have the ballot for all-star voting oh, okay. that they sent to you. <laughs> None of the jerseys, or I got they gave the kids, and we had some auctions and sales for high schools and stuff like that. But the little things that, you know, a bobblehead, uh, had one of those. But the little bitty things, uh, I think that my kids really cherish is Loretta Harmon, one of the workers at the Nuggets made blankets for every time you had a a new child. So I still have those blankets, but I don't have a jersey. (laughs) (laughs) Well, the blankets are obviously very sentimental too, so uh, that's nice to to have those all these years on. The last thing I'd love to ask is um, just about the significance of your jersey numbers. At ASU, you wore number 12, uh, Portland and Denver number 12. In Dallas, you reversed the digits to, to be 21, maybe because of Derek Harper, I'm not sure. Yes. In high school, I saw photos of you wearing number 11 and 24. I'm not sure what your main number was, but is there a particular significance to the numbers that you wore throughout your career, Fat? 12 was the one that has the most significant because I wore it in junior high school. And then when I got to high school, you know, you had two numbers in high school, odd number and even number. So you wore even number at home, odd numbers on the road. So I was 23 and 24. Okay. And then when I got to ASU my freshman year, uh, 24 was already taken. So I went back to 23 and Greg Gorgian and I was there. So then into the freshman year, and this is a story I always tell Greg Gorgian about because he's the one that led up to it, but we'd always have these off-season conditioning drills and myself and Greg were freshmen. Greg and I always wanted to finish first or second to prove ourselves. So he and I had a competition between ourselves. So we're running this mile course and I would always win it. And Greg would always be running behind me changing back and forth and he's always say one two one two one two (laughs) and that's where i started saying okay when greg left i changed from 23 to number 12 at asu and continued it on how good is that that's a fantastic reason (laughs) there's usually some sort of significance behind the numbers and i shouldn't be but i'm surprised when i hear just story after story of how they originated so that's that's awesome thanks for sharing that Yep. Fat, it's been just a pleasure to have you guest on the show. I really appreciate you taking time to, to chat with me. Uh, I hope we can do it again sometime. And uh, until I uh, perhaps see you in person uh, in Chicago, if things work out that way, thanks again for, for being such a great guest on the show today. 
Well, Adam, thanks for having me. I look forward to seeing the podcast and seeing you in Chicago and making sure that you get a chance to see some of the other NBA retired players so they have the opportunity to share their stories as well. That's much appreciated. All the best, and uh, we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening. I welcome your interaction with the show. You can suggest topics or guests you want to hear conversations with. Leave a voicemail. Simply visit inallairness.com slash voice. Click start recording, leave your message and press stop. You can even listen back before submitting. Press send and you're done. Now it's time to share another great review from a fan of the show. This time, thanks to RVD2204. Now I'm confident that's not his real name. In fact, I know his real name. His real name is Ryan Van Dusen. This is from Apple Podcasts USA. It's titled, Excellent Listen, and it reads, Just told Adam this directly, but listening to a two-hour Paul McKeskey interview may be one of the most obscure things I've ever done in my life. Yet, at the same time, nearly the entire episode was full of interesting anecdotes regarding not only McKeskey's individual career, but also anyone and everyone he crossed paths with along the way. There's the time he got his nose broken by a Charles Oakley jab, the time he bribed Don Nelson with copious amounts of beer just to get a shot at joining the 1991 Warriors. He succeeded. And the time opposing crowds threw real-life chickens on the floor at Kansas. Adam's podcast succeeds for many reasons. Chief among them, his laid-back demeanor provides plenty of airspace for guests to share their stories. There's never really a time where you mistake this for a podcast starring Adam Ryan. Rather, it's an Adam Ryan production that serves as a vehicle for others to divulge their own extensive experiences in the game of basketball. He's well-researched and disarming, setting a tone that leaves virtually no stone unturned. If you're interested in the nooks and crannies of NBA history, this podcast may be a can't miss. Thank you very much, Ryan. That is a stellar review. Uh, Much appreciated, mate. For those NBA history buffs out there, and a majority of you listening must be one of those, do check out Ryan's YouTube channel. He has some fantastic, rare clips of many moments throughout the 1990s and into the 2000s, but of course, uh, prior to that as well, just search for his name, Ryan Van Dusen, R-Y-A-N-V-A-N-D-U-S-E-N. A great channel to check out and subscribe to on YouTube. Worldwide, the show now has 121 ratings on Apple Podcasts with an average of four and a half stars. Thanks for your continued support. If you had a review, I'd love to read it out on a future episode. Your ratings and reviews are one of the best ways to support the podcast. If you enjoy the show, please tell your basketball-loving friends about it. As I love to say, your word-of-mouth recommendations are worth their weight in gold. You can stay up to date with my podcast and subscribe to my monthly email newsletter. You will receive exclusive details on upcoming podcast episodes, future high-profile guests to appear on the show, and more. Simply visit inallairness.com slash news. You can subscribe to my show in various ways. Search for In All Airness, three words, on your podcast app of choice. The show is on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Overcast, Android, Pocket Casts, and more. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show and share my web address with your friends and colleagues in allairness.com. Check out the podcast archive for plenty more episodes with high profile guests. Follow me on Twitter at in all Anus. Please add your like to the show's social hub, facebook.com slash in all Anus. Join me next time for another edition of the show.